Father, we thank you this morning, this afternoon for all that you have done so far in this service. Thank you for all you are about to do. Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak to each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. May your word bring forth fruit, may it not return unto you void. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we've prayed. And everyone said amen. Amen, amen. We can have our seats. Hallelujah. Good morning again. <laughs> so as we know, as pastor has been telling us that this month of April, we talk about how we can build better relationships, how we can have an uncommon marriage. And I said the reason why we call it uncommon marriage is because these days what is common is marriages that don't work. Marriages that are uncomfortable, miserable, and that end up in separation. And so we believe that God wants us to have uncommon marriage, which is the marriage he intended us to have in the first place. And so we are talking this morning about extraordinary marriage. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we know that God has told us this is the year of the what? The extraordinary, and so we're thinking about uh, money in our pocket, extraordinary money in our pocket, extraordinary exploits, but are we thinking about extraordinary marriage? Because if we have worked on ourselves to be extraordinary men, extraordinary women, extraordinary children, then what follows is extraordinary marriage, extraordinary home. And when I reflected, I don't know how many people went to listen to last week's message again, I did, and when I reflected on it, what stood out for me was the importance of godly strength in getting through the storms of life. That was what came through from last week. We pastor talked about the importance of a good foundation, a good attitude, internal strength, grit, and reliance on God to get through. And I want to continue that today by talking about 10 things that I know will help you survive any storm of life that arises in your marriage, whether you are married now or you are planning for the future. Sometimes when it comes to marriage talks, people switch off for a variety of reasons. Maybe I'm not yet married, I don't want to be married now, or I've already given up on marriage. But today, everything that is coming out will be for someone here in Jesus' name. But first, before I start on those 10 things, I was reading something yesterday by our general Vasia, Pastor E.A. Adeboy, what I want to share with you. So we're going to go to Matthew 22, verse 30. Matthew 22, verse 30, and it's in line with this sense of humor, so just take it like that. It, the scripture says, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. And I generally say I quoted that scripture to say that since angels do not marry, then why do you expect your spouse to be an angel? <laughs> Amen. It, it may be tongue-in-cheek, but the point remains that your spouse is a human being just like you. Because there are no marriages in heaven. He's not, he or she is not an angel. They are a human being. And every human being is a work in progress, is on their way to perfection. And so you can't expect them to get everything right or act all the way, all the time, how you want them to be. Just as I think you will agree that you yourself don't get everything right all the time. Then also look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this is telling us that even if you, as a person, you feel like I'm, I'm the one I'm always getting it right. The problem is the other person. This scripture is telling us that even if you are good, you can still be better. Why? Because we are to be transformed from glory to glory. So sometimes when we counsel couples, there's a lot of complaint from one side. But know that on the other side too, you yourself can be better and better. And when you look in a mirror, it tells you the truth of who you are. And what is our mirror as Christians? It's the word of God. So until, oh, sound just jumped. <laughs> so until you can read the word and say that there's nothing you should change in yourself, that there's nothing you could do better, then that's the only time you can claim that only your spouse is in the wrong and not you. 
And I don't think any of us can ever look in the word of God and not see something that we should improve in our lives. So as you determine to be the best you can be in spite of the other person that you are married to, then you can steer your marriage in the right direction. So we're talking about personal responsibility today. So we're not going to be, if you're sitting beside your spouse, you know, you're not going to be, you know, doing this with them. It's just talking about you. <laughs> you're not going to be, you know, doing voice recording so that he, can, he or she can listen to it later. He's talking about you. No. And if you are not yet married, you're on that journey, um, be looking inward this morning as we go through. Because many couples um, get into marriage not expecting the level of annoyance that they'll experience towards their spouse. In, and if I were to ask you as a person, as we said, we're looking at ourselves, I was to ask you this morning, are you annoying? I think most of us will say yes. Why? Because we all have traits that irritate others. So just like we are finding the other person annoying, you are also annoying sometimes. If you spend all day, every day, with even your, in quotes, best friend, you know, at some point you will be annoyed with one another. And that's what marriage is. You are spending every day, all the time, with one another. So we, why are we surprised when the other person annoys us, when they get it wrong? You know, why does this build up? You know, it's lots of little irritants that build up into a point where we say, I can't go on in this marriage anymore. So... At a point, we have to say to ourselves, either I can be miserable for the rest of my life, picking out all the things I don't like in this person, or I can accept my spouse for who they are and ask God for the grace to be happy. But for some couples, just accepting their spouse as the way they are means they switch off from the marriage. They, they just say, well, I don't care anymore. You know, let them be how they want and I'll just get on with my life. Um, and then the two are just there in the house together with no relationship, with no sweetness. But that's not uncommon marriage. That's not extraordinary marriage. So we don't want you to say, okay, I will just accept what, what is my lot in life and just be miserable. No, that's not what God wants either. So we can't lose sight so quickly of why we got married in the first place. Many complain that their spouse changed after marriage. But you know that they didn't. What happened was that the blindness that was on our eyes during courtship fell off. <laughs> the love goggles have been taken off. They were the same person then. So, you know, for those not yet married, you know, don't just go with the love goggles. Ask God to show you who is this person. Who is the real person? Who is the spirit? Who is the soul? Who is this person? And God will show you because when the love goggles come off, um, then we have to remind ourselves of what God said. This is why I married the person. Now, Pastor the boy gave insight on this in his book. And I will show you the book is Mathematics of Marriage. You know, he's a mathematician and he has equations inside, but not the scary kind. <laughs> so this is a very good book. I want to recommend it. You can get it online, Mathematics of Marriage. In this day and age, we have no excuse for not having uncommon marriages because there are so much resources out there for us to help our marriages. So I'm going to get to those 10 points. Don't worry, and I won't take long on those 10 points. But I'm still on what was shared in this book because it blessed me so much. Matthew 12, 33. Matthew 12, 33. And that's in the NKJV place. Because they know me. I like the New Living Translation so much. Somebody called it the, the PAV, Pastor Andrea version. <laughs> but this one at the moment, there's something I want us to see in the NKJV. So it says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad for a tree is known by its fruit. Now, we've often quoted that scripture, which means, um, you know, we know a tree by its fruit. So if the fruit is bad, the tree is bad. But look at it closely. It says, either make the tree good, so we can make the tree good, or else make 
the tree bad. So you can make the tree. What is the tree? The tree is your marriage. Or the tree is yourself. Or the tree is your spouse. All three work. Make the tree good and its fruit will be good or else make the tree bad. And he quotes that scripture to say a few things. Number one, a tree that was bearing good fruit before can start bearing bad fruit. But if we go by the Lord's example, it shouldn't be cut down. You know that there was a scripture where the farmer was going to cut down the tree and it represented us. And, and the Lord told the farmer, don't cut it down yet, prune it and it will begin to produce fruit. So that's how we should see our marriages. When storms come, as Pastor told us last week, when trials come, when difficulties come, it's not to cut the tree down. It's to perhaps we need to do some things to help the tree to sprout fruit again. So if you, you yourself begin to see a tree as useless or not worth the effort, then it's what that tree will become. If you take the time to find out why it's going bad and treat it, before long you will enjoy good fruit again. So if things are not going well in your marriage, and I want you to take notes. I'm not seeing too many people writing because if you're not in a storm now, pastor will tell us, if you're not in, in a problem, you're probably going to be in a problem or you've just come out of a problem. Problems are all around. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. Yes, the Lord delivers us from them all, but there are problems. So even if you're listening to me now and you're thinking, oh, my marriage is sweet, everything is great, there will come a time when you need this word. So make notes on that. So I said, if you see it as not worth any effort, then it will, that tree will die, that marriage will die. So what can we do? Sometimes a tree has become choked and it needs fresh air if we're talking about your spouse now is is it the case that maybe your spouse is overwhelmed with responsibilities with um, worries with concerns and perhaps they need fresh air they need breathing space and pruning in that case means you as a spouse taking on some of the responsibilities some of the worries, some of the concerns, just to give some breathing space. So there's something that your spouse always seems to do, but just once in a while you can help when you see that perhaps my spouse is needing a breathing space. That can be maybe childcare. That can be help with their studies. If you see your spouse overwhelmed with their studies, you don't just tell them, it'll be well with you. I'll pray for you. What can you do? You can do something practically. Um, Pastor and I, if one of us is struggling in studies, what do we do? We'll help the other person. When he, when he was doing his MBA, I'm there making all the diagrams <laughs> for his thesis. So I'll go look for the diagram. He'll give me the te- you know, what he wants it to look like, what the text inside should be. And, you know, just help him, not doing, you know, professors are here. I'm not doing his work for him. <laughs> Don't do their work for them. <laughs> Just being careful. But, you know, you can help. That's what I mean. If they don't know where to find the information, you can go and help them to find the information. You can read through their work. You can make suggestions. When I was doing my master's, the same thing. He's helping me with information. If he's reading, just reading by the way and something comes up that's in line with what I'm studying, he'll send it to me. So just give some breathing space sometimes. When the other person is struggling, the tree will begin to bear fruit again. There's something else called mulching. I've never heard of this before. It's called mulching, M-U-L-C-H-I-N-G. And it's where you put a protective covering around the root of the tree to protect it from weeds and disease. What does that represent in our marriage, in our spouse? Maybe there are outside voices that are speaking and harming your marriage. It's causing disease in the roots of your marriage. So you could just condemn the voices as nonsense, but the fact is that those voices, they they have an impact on your home. So don't just cast them off as nothing. Take time when you are hearing some things from your spouse and you know it's coming from an outside voice, 
you can just take them aside, talk and reassure them that that is not the case in your own marriage. It's important. And even in social media, you know, I, I remember a time pastor will send me videos from one particular pastor, always talking about what the woman should do in her home. Always what the woman should do. And I said, is there anyone that's talking about what the man should do? Remember? <laughs> but all these voices that are talking all the time, you know, all the clips on social media, all the, the latest thing is um, revenge pranks. Do you see them on social media? Where they make videos and they're trying to catch out the person. And it's done as entertainment. All of those videos are fake, but we, we don't know how that is actually impacting our relationships. For those who are not married among us, when they see those things, it's building fear that every man is unfaithful. Every woman cannot be trusted. It's building some, a narrative in our mind. So try and reduce such external influences. If you have to, take a break from social media. The last point, a tree there for this section. A tree can also be made good by disinfectant, which fights infection. So has anything that either of you in your marriage has done in the past infected your marriage? It, with actions or words? You will have to sit down and discover it and undo it. Because there are things that e maybe either of you have spoken or said or done that has almost like, dis, you know, infected the roots of the marriage and you're just dealing with you're only dealing with the, the fruits that you're seeing. You're not dealing with the roots. So you need to go back over and think, is there some things that happened some years ago? It can be, uh, we've seen marriages break down over things that happened even years ago. So have you gone back to undo those behaviors? And who, can, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Who is that? Jesus He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can go back into the foundation and repair the root of the tree, the root of your marriage. So you can ask God to reset your foundation. So that is from this book, and that's only about two, three pages of that book. So you can imagine how blessed you will be. So moving on, what are the 10 things we should do to have a sweet, uncommon, and extraordinary marriage? Number one, Listen without interrupting. You know, Pastor will always note that I can be very practical. I want to give practical tips. And the interesting thing is, everything I'm saying, there's a corresponding scripture in the Bible. The Bible is so practical. Listen to your spouse without interrupting. It sounds simple, but it's very difficult. <laughs> Proverbs 18 verse 2. Proverbs 18 verse 2. I'll read the NKGV and the NLT. It says, A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. So someone who is in a conversation and has no desire to actually understand what the other person is saying, but only wants to express their own point of view, the Bible calls them what? A fool. Oh dear. The NLT also is not any gentler. It also calls them such people fools. It says, fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. So every conversation is just about airing your own opinion. No, talking outside of just regular conversation about critical issues, it's often uncomfortable. And so we don't really want to listen to critical um, conversations. And I have to say that men and women communicate quite differently. For men, they want to just quickly know what the problem is so that they can fix it. Just give me a 60-second summary. What is the problem so I can fix it? But women, we, we go the long way around because we want to express every feeling, every emotion, and we want to feel listened to. So you, whatever side you are on, you need to ask God for patience to help you to listen so that you will not interrupt to say what you think they were trying to say. Have you ever done that where you, where you jump in halfway? Okay, so what you're saying is, no, that wasn't what I was saying. You never listen to me and off it goes. So don't do that. And ladies, ask for grace to get to the point. 
Amen. Then what about, so that's just patience, a patience issue. But what about when we don't like what the other person is saying? And we want to jump in with our opinion that what, what you're saying is wrong. That's not what I did. That's not what happened. Again, we have to ask for grace to wait to, before responding. Proverbs 18, 13. Proverbs 18, 13. It says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. The NLT puts it less politely. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. Oh dear. So if we, if we answer without listening to the full fa facts, we are shameful and foolish according to the word of God because you don't know that the person was going somewhere and they were actually already going to correct the statement that they made. So be careful with that. If listening is difficult, try some techniques that will help you train yourself um, to wait and also the spouse who's doing the talking please don't take it for granted this listening ear that you have don't be ranting endlessly don't make long speeches just make short statements that then can be responded to number two now is also continuing to speak to the speaker so the first one was the listener this is the speaker speak without accusing again i hope we are taking notes speak without accusing the other person. Proverbs 15, 1 to 4. It says, A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. So when you have a genuine concern that you want to share with your spouse, the way you say it matters a lot. The Bible says harsh words make tempers flare. So when you put it harshly, so that means you need to rehearse beforehand how you're going to put it nicely. Don't just speak out of, you know, out of just the top of your head. It continues, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing, but the mouth of a fool belches out foolishness. Belching is like uncontrollable. So the mouth of a fool is just talking without making a rational, balanced statement. So have a soft tone even when you're angry or upset. It achieves more. Sometimes I will catch my, if myself, I'll hear myself making a statement and I realize that my tone is too high. And I literally tell, my, tell myself audibly, okay, let me bring my tone down. And I have to actually, let me bring my tone down and say it again. Because we might not even realize how we have to listen to ourselves when we talk. James 1.19, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. What do you want to say when you're very stressed up? Let me put it this way. How many times have you had an argument with someone and you've typed a text message and deleted it? And then you've typed it again and deleted it and typed it again because you want to send this very angry message to someone but you realize that's probably not the best thing to do and you delete it. Thank goodness for WhatsApp's um, delete function. <laughs> but when we're in a conversation with someone, it's very hard. You can't press delete. Once you've said it, you've said it. There's no delete button. So we have to be careful about what, how we put things, how we say them, when there's fire, when there's stress. Why not wait, calm down? And you know what? Most of the time, I delete those long, I can write essays on WhatsApp. And then I realize, once I've calmed down, I realize actually it doesn't even matter. I don't even need to send that message. So you might calm down, realize you don't even need to say anything at all. And the last point under that section is Romans 2 verse 1. So we are talking about speaking without accusing. Romans 2 1. You may think you can condemn such people. So you may think you can condemn your spouse. But what? You are just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do this very same thing. Verse 2. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid judgment when you do the same thing? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? 
Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? It's saying what I said at the beginning, that if I judge my spouse for behaving a certain way, then I'm also condemned by the same judgment. So unless there's nothing wrong in me, then I can't judge the other person. So don't um, speak and accuse the person. Just reason with them. I prefer it if, if you could do it this way. Or I prefer that. Don't accuse the person. The third one, sort of in the same line, is answer without arguing. Answer without arguing. Proverbs 17, 1. It says, better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. NLT says, better a dry crust eaten in peace than a house filled with feasting and conflict. When you're answering the concerns and the complaints of your spouse, so you've listened, you've been patient, you've listened, the person has spoken to you without accusing you and you've listened, now it's your turn to respond. How are you going to respond to the complaints? You know, a lot of people don't like um, even constructive criticism. We find it very hard to be talked to and corrected. But we have to try and respond with grace. Don't answer with anger. Try to take it on board. The, the other person may, might be wrong in their understanding. But that's okay. You just say, okay. I tell this even to my children. Sometimes I will tell them they've done something wrong. They want to say, ah, no, 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 no. I say, okay. Even if you think it's wrong what I said, just say, okay. And go and take it to God and ask God to show you. That is the best way. So don't, um, you know, have a counter argument all the time. Why not just say, okay, maybe there's something I'm not seeing. If my spouse is seeing this, I don't think that's what I'm doing, but let me go and pray about it and let God show us. And then at a different time, you can now be the speaker. You can now come to your spouse and say, okay, you know, you said this, I reflected on it, I prayed about it, I realized maybe um, this or that was not correct. But on this aspect, I'm not really certain you were correct. The way we talk really matters. Avoid making the home a battleground. Once the home is a battleground, then the, your spouse doesn't want to come home. They will find the reasons to be out of the home and then you're dealing with a whole other issue of external influences and so on. If possible, you know, when you are having um, a, a heated discussion, if things are getting too intense, why don't both of you go for a walk outside and talk calmly? Because you know when you're in your house, you just shout. Because you're in your house, I can yell. Nobody knows, except the neighbors are hearing you. But you think nobody hears you. But if you go outside for a walk, get some fresh air, talk calmly. Don't let the home be a battleground. The home should be your safe space. My next point, I believe it's point number four, is share without pretending. So this is two ways. So if I'm going to share without pretending, if I'm going to tell you my real feelings, if I'm going to expose myself to you, if I'm going to open up to you, then the way you receive that is important. So this is for both um, aspects. The person who is listening needs to, you know, not jump, but to give the person the same grace God has given us. And we need to not pretend. Nobody is a mind reader. One of the biggest problems that happens in marriages is that we are sitting there expecting the other person to know why we are upset. If you ever ladies ever going around banging doors you know <laughs> expecting that he knows why you're upset vice versa actual fact is they may not have a clue I remember early days in, in our marriage did my very best at banging everything and being more and more frustrated as to why he's happy and smiling and singing how dare you be happy when I'm upset you, you know actually he had, has absolutely no idea that I, I remember one time you said oh I thought you were just meditating in the Lord <laughs> I saw your frowning face. I just thought you were in the spirit. I was like, you didn't hear all the banging I was doing? No. <laughs> so I was torturing myself for like two days, wondering why he's not responding, getting more and more angry. All I needed to do was tell him in the first place, this is why I'm upset. So share without pretending. 
Don't keep your complaints and concerns to yourself for the sake of peace. If you can share those concerns in the right way, as we've just told you to, there should be no fear in sharing them. But as I said, as the receiving person, be gracious. I remember um, a particular day where I pastor traveled and I banged the car. I didn't have an accident. It was literally the most ridiculous thing. There's like a, a post outside our house which has been there forever. And I drive past it every day, but this day I was reversing and hit, the, hit it. And it caught into the, the side of the car and, and as I moved, it tore, it tore part of the car. And I looked at it and I said, how on earth do I tell him what's happened? And I thought, I'll just take a picture and send it to him. I took a picture and sent it and said, I'm really sorry. He didn't answer. Oh. <laughs> so I had to call him and say, this is what has happened. And he was incredibly gracious. You know what he said? He said, at least you are still alive. It's just a car. Oh. Let's clap for pastor. So that means that one thing, I shouldn't take it for granted and just be banging the car anytime. But it means that if I make another mistake, I'm not going to be so afraid and terrified of how he's going to react. Yeah? So we must be honest, but make sure we receive graciously. Romans 12 verse 9. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. So don't pretend be genuine. Sarah's 10 says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. The next point is, um, remember these are points on how we can have an uncommon, um, extraordinary marriage. Give without sparing. Give without sparing. I'll read Proverbs 21, 26. He covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. So instead of coveting, instead of every day waking up wondering, why is my spouse not fulfilling my needs? Why is he or she not doing what I need them to do? Why are they not the person I need them to be? That, the Bible is saying that's coveting greedily. Rather, we should give and do not spare. If you wake up every day thinking about what you can do to make your spouse's life better, then your marriage will be sweet. That's what we do. That's, people always say, how come you, you know, you're so happy? That's what we do. We look for ways to be a blessing to one another every day. Don't focus on what your spouse is or isn't doing. Just do your own. Anytime you're discouraged, wondering why bother. Have you ever stomped around the house going, I don't know why I even bother. But when you feel like that, go back to the foot of the cross. We know the cross is not just for Easter. If we stay at the foot of the cross and we look up and we see Jesus, I mean, I know Jesus is not on the cross. He's resurrected in heaven. But just the imagery of remembering what he did, how he suffered, the insults he bore, the beating he took. When you meditate on what he did for you and I, and he didn't know whether that love would ever be reciprocated, he did it anyway. And that's the love we are meant to have for one another. We don't know whether it will ever be reciprocated, but we love anyway. That is the life God has called us to. And so linked to that is the next point. Enjoy marriage without complaint. I'm sure you are saying, no, pastor, you are just, you're, it's too much. What do you mean? I can't complain. Am I not a human being? It's not me. It's the Bible. Philippians 2.14. Do everything. Does it say only some things? Do everything, including your marriage, without complaining and arguing. There's no point doing something if you're going to do it grudgingly. You know, even God said we should be a cheerful giver. So as we are giving without sparing, we are giving without complaining. What about, you know, before you got married? You know, those that are in courtship together. Before marriage, weren't you tripping over each other to be kind? Tri tripping over each other to show love, to, to, you know, to be a blessing to one another. Why should that be different? Because you're married. So we need to enjoy without complaint. Well, the words you speak, they have life. The next point is trust without wavering. 
trust without wavering. First Corinthians 13, 7, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. We're not saying to trust man alone. We're not saying to trust woman. It says we should trust in God. We have to trust in God to bring his promises to pass. What he has said concerning you, your destiny, your purpose, your life, it can't be thwarted by who you marry. What he said concerning you will come to pass. Never give up. Never lose faith. Remember that your spouse is first God's child, and then he's your spouse or she's your spouse. So if things are not going well, ask the Lord to intervene. Don't call down fire on them. Don't pray them out of your home. No, pray that God will correct in mercy, that God will bring them back to you, that God would restore your marriage, your peace, and your joy. And if trust has been broken in marriage, then you have to ask God to do what I said earlier, repair the foundation. It's not your spouse. You know, when trust has been broken, we are, you know, all the, the person who broke the trust is always on the lower foot, always trying to gain ground, always trying to um, impress, always trying to, you know, make things up. But that's an impossible task and it won't work. So who can heal our broken hearts is only God. Psalm 147 verse 3 said, He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. So the first thing to do when trust has been broken in marriage is to go and ask God to heal your broken heart, to heal your wounds, to bandage your wounds, to give back your joy. And it's only with that new mindset that you can now give again in your marriage. I have three more points. Prove without punishing. Prove without punishing. What do I mean? You can um, prove, you, don't, you know, when someone has done something wrong um, in the marriage, we want to punish the person. We want to prove a point. We want to score points. We want to show that I'm fine without you. I, you know, I can do fine. We, we do all this sort of thing. Colossians 2.13 tells us that's not what God does with us. He says, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God did what? God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. There's, there's no point saying I will not forgive my spouse until they do X, Y, Z. There's no point withholding love until you feel the person has learned their lesson. There's no point in silent treatment. I'll not speak to them until they put it right because these are all part of what's called dirty fighting. It's still, you're still fighting with the person when it's God that can change the heart of a man, not we. We need to pour love, more and more love. Psalm 85.10. Psalm 85.10. It says, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. This scripture is about Christ. In him there is truth, but there's also mercy. In him there is righteousness, but there's also peace. And we are to reflect Christ in our marriage. The point before the last is we should make promises without forgetting. Don't make promises that and then forget about the promise. It's very harmful. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 5. Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says, It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. Verse 7 says, Talk is cheap, like daydreams and other useful, useless activities. Fear God instead. So don't just make empty promises that you know you are not going to keep. Make a promise. And when you make a promise, make a plan on how you're going to fulfill the promise. There's no point in saying in five years' time, I'll buy you a car with no plan of how you're going to do that. There's no point promising that I'll do better, I'll communicate better, if we don't go and learn and train ourselves on how to do better. So anytime you make a promise, make a plan. If we don't plan, we plan to fail. And the last point, before I make this point, I wanted to, I've not had time to go into it, but this um, magazine is Sunrise Magazine, which is, the magazine of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, UK. And only a few of them were given out at Festival of Life. You didn't go. We don't have too many extra copies. But every edition is online. 
And there are resources in here. There's relationship columns. There's a column actually called Ask Andrea. And I happen to be the Andrea they are asking. <laughs> Amen. So I'm not plugging myself, but I'm just saying that these are online. We'll send out the, the link. And there, there's the questions that people have asked and the answers that have been given are things that can help you because they are very practical, even relating the, what's in here relates to even what we spoke about today. But the last point is pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Colossians 1.9, it says, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask. So what, we are not meant to cease to pray. And what are we meant to ask? That you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You can pray that your spouse will be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and understanding. You can pray for yourself also. And I'm full of resources today. This is another wonderful book. This is called um, The Power of a Praying Wife by Stormy O'Martian. There's also The Power of a Praying Husband that she wrote. There's also The Power of a Praying um, Parent also that she wrote. Because if you are, you are confused about what to pray about, Lord, bless my husband, bless his job, bless his, you know, you know keep him today, protect him in Jesus' name, amen. The one-minute prayer is not what you need. This book, it has 30 different chapters, and each chapter is a different prayer point. Things like pray for his work, his finances, his sexuality, his affection, his temptations, his mind, his fears, his purposes, his choices, his health, his protection, and it goes on. So if you're confused about, Pastor, I don't know what to pray about, then get yourself this book and the other ones like it. And in this book, Stormy O'Martian, she shared the story of how she was at the point of divorce. Her husband was the most, um, you know, abusive um, man that, that was make emotionally abusive. And she, you know, she heard an instruction from God that she should pray for him. And she was angry with God and said, pray for him? How can I pray for him? Every time she went to pray for him, she was just filled with anger. She couldn't pray for him. She didn't know what to pray about. And that's how God gave her the book. God spoke to her, pray for this, pray for that, pray for this. And by the time she finished, he changed around and their marriage became sweet. Prayer changes things. So I want us to begin now by praying. So can we be on our feet? We want to pray now. We want to pray for our spouse. If you're not yet married, you can pray for the one that God has selected for you. I always tell young people that there is someone God already has created for you from the foundation, before the foundation of the world. So you, you can already, I began to pray for my husband years and years before I met him, before I knew he existed. I, pray, I was praying for him. You can do the same thing. You're married, you can pray. If you're here with your spouse, you could hold hands with your spouse and pray together. If you're not here with your spouse, just begin to pray. We want to pray that they be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. So can we begin to pray, Father, my spouse, fill them with the wisdom of God. Fill us, begin to say, fill us with the wisdom of God. Fill us with the knowledge of your will. Fill us with spiritual understanding. Pray for yourself, pray for your spouse, pray God's blessing upon your spouse, pray for success, pray for fulfillment of purpose, pray they will make wise choices, pray for their peace of mind, pray for their health, pray for their protection, pray they will overcome temptation, pray they will overcome every trial in the name of Jesus. Father, we are coming to you, we are asking, oh Lord, as we have heard your word this morning, that Lord, we will put this into practice. We will pray without ceasing. Pray for the strength of God to be renewed in your marriage. Pray that your marriage will be extraordinary in the name of Jesus.